Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for another uh, series of, um, you know, presentation here. And I would like to introduce you to uh, Monica Spiller with the Whole Grain Connection. And I'll let her give you a quick introduction of herself before she digs into the presentation that she has prepared for us. Uh, that it's titled Potential for Whole Wheat Flour Milling in California. Go ahead, Monica, please. Thank you, Claudia. <clears throat> yes, I'm Monica Spiller and I'm with the Whole Grain Connection and the Whole Grain Connection promotes whole grains, especially here in California. And uh, we, one of our projects is to supply seed of heritage varieties of wheat to the farmers in California. And those varieties are appropriate for California. And it, for the most part, they're grown here and they're used for producing 100% whole grain flour. So let's get started and uh, you'll notice this is the second part of a present presentation. The title, Potential for Whole Wheat Flour Milling in California. There's not enough of it as yet. So I'd like to describe for you some whole wheat flour mill systems and some marketing considerations. And you'll notice I have the wheat penny as, as a motive here, and wheat penny has wheat on it, emphasizing the importance of that as a crop and as a food, and also the original motto for the United States, a eh? pluribus unum. And I'm interpreting that as we are all in this together. We need producers of whole wheat flour and we need eaters of whole wheat flour. So why the emphasis on whole wheat flour production and the need for making pleasing whole grain foods? Well, we have epidemic Western diseases here. Those are obesity and hypertension and constipation and colon cancer and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And all of those can be largely prevented by replacing all basic grain foods with 100% whole grain versions. And the protective compounds that prevent these Western diseases are practically all found in the bran and the germ of the whole grain. They are essentially absent from refined wheat flour and other refined grains like uh, polished rice. And it's been recognized that whole grains are an essential part of the so-called Mediterranean diet and all the other recommended healthy diets. And that disease protection from these healthy diets, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> that disease protection from all these healthy diets is effective across all ethnic and racial groups. And by now, in 2020, we've learned enough about whole wheat milling and baking that the craft is, of both is really very well developed. We've learned much since the whole grain movement began in the 1980s. And whole wheat millers and bakers now can work with a wide range of wheat types. 
So let's get started with a consideration of the, mil the mills and the total system that's needed once a mill is installed. So here we have a Meadows mill, an eight inch Meadows mill, um, eight inch granite stone here. It's set vertically and it's driven by an electric motor under the base. And uh, the flower collection is in this bag below the mill. And that mill is closed around the exit, but the, the bag is breathable. That's important. Uh, it's breathable and essentially it's fine enough mesh that it acts as a flower bag, a collecting bag, and also provides dust control. And the rate of production here is about 30 pounds an hour. Um, you can do that 30 pounds in 10 pound batches. The, the uh, hopper holds about 10 pounds. But the problem with this size of a mill and indeed with a fast stone mill is that the stones get hot and for the most part you, this kind of mill would only be used to produce say 30 pounds of flour before allowing the mill to cool down. So you can prevent some of that heating by adding the, the grain to the mill at a slower pace, but uh, for the most part, you, you do need to uh, notice that the stones get hot. And uh, as well, the mill needs to have well-dressed and well-maintained stones for the best flower. So in this next slide, we have uh, an osteroller stone mill that's three to four feet in diameter. The stones determine the di diameter here. And the stones are set horizontally. <clears throat> but the key thing is that this can produce flour at a much greater rate, 10 times the rate of the eight inch stone. <clears throat> Can produce the flour at about 300 pounds an hour and because the stone is larger and it is possible to modify the the rotation to reduce the rotation of the stones it is possible to produce a somewhat cooler much cooler flour with care in this system uh, what's also not notable is the dust control system here. Um, the bag of flour would be underneath this conical device, which is a cyclone. The bag of flour would be under here, and that's where the flour would collect. And the cyclone sends the finest particles back down into the flour bag instead of out into the atmosphere. And uh, also there is a dust collecting device beside the mill. But notice the, the size of this setup, the dust collection and the cyclone to control the flower in the air in a, in a, a mill. Um, it's relatively small. <clears throat> but Instead of going to another stone mill, let's consider instead um, an air-swept high-speed impact mill, such as the Unifine. And you can see um, the miller uh, at Sunrise Flower Mill, he has one. And uh, you can see the size of it and the motor underneath in this dark, part underneath the mill. The entry of the grains, it will be through, through these two side pipes and barely vi visible. 
Um, pardon me, I've got a hitch here. Um, <clears throat> so this, uh, sorry about that. Um, the Unifying Mill has a much smaller footprint, but this particular size mill produces 1,200 pounds an hour. That's four times the amount that we were, would produce in that uh, osteoroller. So that's a lot more flour in an hour, and these mills can just keep going. There's no, no need to <clears throat> wait for cool down. And the flour is kept cool because the mechanism involves air flowing very fast through this equipment. So it's 1,200 pounds an hour of very fine and very cool flour, which is commendable as far as I can tell. So a similar mechanism mill is produced by Hosokawa, but they've added an, a, a, a part to it, an air classifier, instead of relying only on the cyclone after the flower exits, they have a cyclone inside the mill system. So at the base, there is the flower mill of the same general type as the unifying, but above it, there's uh, an air classifier, and that throws the larger bran and germ flakes back down into the mill so that they'll be at the right fineness when they exit. And here's the exit, this square boxy thing at the side is part of the exit. So a mill like this is made in a wide range of sizes and uh, you could go up to say 5,000 pounds an hour. And similarly, the Reynolds pulverizer is an air swept impact mill. And this time the mill itself is set vertically. Doesn't seem, I don't know the difference between the two. They seem both to be effective. And this particular mill is installed in a mill in Canada and produces 3,000 pounds an hour. So we had the Meadows Mill at 30 pound an hour, the Osteroller at 300 pounds an hour, and now we have a mill at 3,000 pounds an hour. So what does that mill look like when it's put into a system and you'll see the mill is very small on the left compared with the hopper and definitely compared with the cyclone but the thing is that with this high output of flour the possibility of dust is increased and uh, just the whole system is so much faster and uh, more productive, it's necessary to have a much larger cyclone and a much larger dust collector. So what does that look like in a, in a mill? And uh, this mill in Ontario, Canada has one of these Reynolds pulverizers and uh, it's off the screen to the left and small and you can see the, I should have a person in here and then you'd understand uh, the size uh, better. But uh, this is a bagging equipment on the right. So a 50 pound bag comes out eventually from the from this uh, conveyor. <clears throat> so if we are planning a mill on a farm and we want to mimic this uh, 3,000 pounds an hour, that's 
that's nice and fast. It's not too fast, it's about the right speed, I think. Um, <clears throat> you would need to have a high ceiling, about 20 feet. You would need um, plenty of open space to accommodate all that equipment, say up to 5,000 square feet. You would need a solid floor. Moving everything around with a forklift needs a solid floor, pallets are a ton. So that's a lot of weight on a floor. It needs to be well constructed. And uh, all that equipment needs electricity. So heavy duty electric power needs to be there. And uh, we are doubtless going to want to wash something, have bathrooms and so on. So water and plumbing needs to be installed and it is a noisy system there's there's no getting away from it especially this high speed impact mill is a is a noisy sounds like a jet so it's very it's very noisy and uh, but it is possible to isolate that mill in a soundproof room that's millers do that um, and also the building itself needs insulation uh, so that there's a reasonable temperature control in the heat of summer or the cold of winter. And the building needs to be sealed well against pest invasion. And uh, there's a lot of maneuvering going on. So the entries and exits need to accommodate a forklift and a tall load. These are just, this is just a checklist. And uh, somebody's going to actually do the work of the milling. And truly, the, an operation like this needs to have a professional miller or, uh, or a professional engineer who can accommodate this um, maintenance and uh, operation of a system like this. Uh, the uh, Canadian mill, uh, Mark in uh, Canada, he is over the moon with enthusiasm for this mill and uh, he says that the maintenance is easy and fast, so downtime is not, uh, not a problem. And uh, so, but still, it needs somebody in charge of, a, of an operation like this who has studied the situation and can handle all that equipment and knows about the flower, of course, and uh, probably two to three full time workers. And uh, it's a job to install a mill like that. And uh, most farmers are very independent, but uh, in this case, a mill like this um, Reynolds pul pulverizer or the Unifine mill, um, those mill manufacturers usually have an experienced associate engineer who would design the total system to match the size of that mill. The mill itself, you would probably buy directly from the manufacturer and also have this expertise available, but uh, the cyclone and the dust collecting and uh, the piping, all of that can of course be installed by local people. And in fact, you can um, purchase those apart from the mill manufacturer. Uh, so we've considered the actual building for the mill, but uh, truly there's more to it than, than just milling the flour and uh, keeping the dust down we have to consider that the grain needs to be received 
in there. And so you need an outside area for the trucks that are delivering the grain and uh, possibly you'll need a dock for, the, for those trucks. And uh, as well, you'll need a certain amount of grain storage so that you're not waiting for the next truck load of grain and can just keep on milling if you want to and circumstances favor that. Uh, so say you might need storage for at least a month and ideally you would have enough storage for a year for real food security. Um, so now we have the grain in storage and available. How is it going to get into the mill itself and fed into the mill hopper? And I uh, have three basic possibilities for doing that. A neat one is to take a tote bag, which is the usual delivery form for grain. Uh, a one ton tote bag can be lifted with a forklift so that it's above the hopper of the mill and it can be fed into the hopper. The hopper usually has an adjust, adjustment to um, regulate the flow of the grain into the mill. Um, another system for feeding the grain into the mill can be a pneumatic system, a sort of vacuum system and piping. And similarly, an auger can be used to carry the grain into the hopper. And then you have the mill itself, and uh, we have to have a means of collecting the flour away from the mill and uh, ready for bagging, maybe, instead of bagging it absolutely as it comes off the mill. And we've mentioned dust reduction. We need a flour bagging system. Uh, manual flour bagging is okay for one or two bags, but uh, not when you have 3,000 pounds an hour coming and coming out from the mill and available. So a good 50 pound flour bagging system is useful. And uh, where are you going to put those bags? Well, you put them on a pallet, probably. And uh, you need the indoor forklifts, which of course would need to be electric. You can't have a gasoline powered forklift indoors. Um, and uh, that flour, just before it's distributed, will be on those pallets and you need space to store them short term until they're distributed. And uh, we're going to distribute the flour to bakeries, so you might want a truck. So all these things need to be thought of ahead of time because they're expenses and uh, considerations. And uh, of course, as we've mentioned before, there are workers actually doing all this Primarily in California, the wheat is a commodity crop. And uh, so the commodity wheat growing by larger growers is usually on about, um, it's certainly more than 50 acres, it's usually 100 or 200 or even more acres. And it's usually conventional. Most frequently it's hard red wheat. The acreage is something like 400,000 acres in California and some, some durum and some hard wheat, excuse me, some hard white wheat are also grown. And the wheat handler is an important function in this, in this process. The wheat handler is the one who has supplied the seed usually to the farmer 
and it's usually a modern, short stature, proprietary variety that was developed particularly for conventional agriculture and refined flour milling. And that wheat handler pays the farmer a, the commodity price for wheat that is combine harvested straight out of the field. So the farmer combine harvests that wheat and uh, puts it straight into a truck from the wheat handler and says goodbye to his wheat or their wheat. And uh, they're paid a commodity price and that's it. So the farmer has no stake in their wheat after it leaves the field. And uh, add another consideration, the land value is high in California. So wheat production is more expensive than in the Midwest or Canada. And that commodity price is currently often inadequate for the California farmer. It doesn't, doesn't um, make it a very meaningful operation to produce that wheat currently. So the large wheat handlers have a better deal because they receive the wheat, they have the opportunity to clean the wheat, and then they are the ones who actually sell it still somewhat restricted by the commodity prices, but uh, they have added value. They can sell wheat for milling and for seed and for feed. Add another consideration, and you, we used to have a good export market for California grown white wheat and durum, but uh, those markets to Asia have greatly decreased over the last decade or even perhaps two decades. So where does this wheat go then? Well, there are nine large mills, commodity mills in California, and they, all of them, primarily produce refined flour and just a very small fraction 6% roughly, as whole grain flour. And it's a recombined whole grain flour because the system produces primarily refined flour. So they have to recombine to get the whole wheat flour. And those large mills currently have no incentives to use California grown wheat. So Sometimes the California grown wheat is not even purchased by these large mills. So the result of all this is that uh, California wheat farmers are replacing their large wheat, farm, wheat fields with almond orchards. Feel that that's a better use for their land monetarily. And uh, the other thing that's happening is that these large growers sell their wheat more profitably as green chop or grain for animal feed. And the larger California wheat farmers, as a result, are now definitely looking for new markets for their wheat, or a way to add value to their crop. So there is actually a local wheat system, a local wheat processing system that's gradually built up in California along with the gradual buildup of um, independent whole grain production. And these growers are usually very small, definitely less than uh, 50 acres, often just five or 10 acres. And uh, that wheat is usually grown organically 
and using non-proprietary varieties of wheat. Also for these farmers, wheat is grown as a rotation crop, a rotation cover crop after vegetables in a regenerative agriculture system. And uh, these heritage wheat varieties are chosen so that they are appropriate for the climate in California. They're chosen for the farmer and the climate rather than for a baker's idea. And what's happened is that the bakers have pivoted to making good use of interesting and different varieties of wheat. So to accommodate this very small acreage, there are some very small, small scale grain cleaning facilities and mills on farms primarily. Um, there aren't very many of them and they are local to the wheat that's being grown. But this system cannot expand and other farmers cannot join in this uh, production of uh, heritage wheat and whole grain end products unless they have access to cleaning and milling. So there's a limitation there so far. However, the system does offer great opportunities for growth. There's an increasing appreciation for the health and flavor of um, fresh 100% whole wheat flour. And some farms and bakeries indeed have their own mills to produce 100% whole wheat flours. And some bakeries, not even associated with farms, have their own mills. And those are producing breads in much larger amounts. It's very encouraging. And uh, on the small scale, there is a market. Um, the farmers markets are very well established and popular and uh, the farms manage community supported agriculture projects or, or they can just sell to small mills and bakeries. So imagining this localized system on a much larger scale how would it compare with the commodity system? Let's make a comparison. Um, for, for starters, um, the grain in the localized system would be stored locally, ready for milling, of course, but it would be stored locally. Whereas in the commodity system, the grain is, is uh, converted to refined flour and it's the refined flour that's stored and it's stored centrally. There's no particular effort to have it in smaller amounts locally. In the localized system, the end product goal is whole grain, whole grain products and whole grain flour and the single step whole grain mills are very efficient and they are available and they're available in, in sizes ranging from kitchen to very large mill supplying a commercial bakery. Whereas in the commodity system, the milling process is multi-step very complex. There's a need to have a, a large mill to make it uh, economical. The whole, wheat the, the whole wheat flour is a recombination recomb of the parts that have been separated in the refining process. So it's just a large and complex process compared with the easy single step at all levels of size for, for the localized system. And in the localized system, 
the mills are nearby. And so the whole wheat flour that's produced in a single step is fresh. And so it has the best flavor and it has the best nutritional value. And in the commodity system, that recombined whole wheat flour is produced in such a way that its flavor is compromised and it's rarely fresh because the tendency is to store it as whole grain flour rather than uh, produce it freshly. Uh, so the whole wheat flour can be milled fresh in the localized system and on demand for local bakers, especially of course, if the mills are themselves localized. So in the case of the localized system, those stone mills can use all kinds of wheat. Whereas in the commodity system, the system was actually designed for hard red wheat of a particular hardness. And so the farmers are limited in the wheat that they can grow and know would be wanted by the commodity mill. And uh, with the localized system, we have the potential to easily supply the entire population with the recommended amounts of whole wheat flour. The recommendation is that at least half of our daily grain foods should be whole grain. I'd say all of the basic foods should be whole grain. It amounts to about the same thing. Uh, take the commodity system and they have definitely failed to supply the population with this recommended amount of whole wheat flour, despite the knowledge that we need this, that's been available since at least the 1970s and actually before that. So in the case of finally, in the case of these local small mills, they would be able to accommodate the small batches that are produced by smaller wheat growers, smaller local wheat growers who are just growing wheat in, as a rotation rather than as um, a major crop. And uh, in the commodity system, there's no way that uh, those small batches can be accommodated. So localized systems win as far as I can tell. So if they do win, how, how are we going to get to that situation of uh, local milling. How many small local mills would we need in California? It's pretty large population in California, 39.5 or whatever million. So that's a lot of people wanting a lot of flour. So <clears throat> how many of these mills would we need to mill just half of our current total wheat usage in the commodity system? So the amount, these are very, very rounded numbers so that you can make a mental comparison. Um, <clears throat> so the amount of wheat that's milled annually by the commodity mills is something like 3,500 million pounds. And a small mill at 3,000 pounds an hour that we've just described would, um, you know, just, just in, a, in a sort of leisurely or a normal working week, and uh, most of the weeks in the year, but not all, they might produce five million pounds. That's just five million pounds. So how many of those small mills would we need in the state to produce just half of that commodity wheat into flour, and uh, you can do the arithmetic <clears throat> at home afterwards, uh, but I reckon it's something like 350 
small mills. And uh, when you think about it, the actual wheat usage in California is much closer to being 6,000 million pounds. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of cookies and uh, what have you that are in the grocery store that uh, are produced with flour that's not come from a California commodity mill. So that means that most of the wheat that's milled in California could actually be to produce whole grain flour. And uh, if practically all of that 3,500 pounds was milled into whole grain flour, that would pretty much satisfy those dietary recommendations. And also bear in mind that the wheat that's grown in California currently, we're, we're not a major wheat grower. We grow too many other wonderful vegetable, fruits and vegetables to only grow wheat. So the amount of wheat that's grown is about uh, 1,200 million pounds each year. So locally owned mills, if they were present in California, you can bet would prefer to have California grown grain. So that California grown grain would have a market right there with interested local ownership of the mills. There'd be local job creation to run those mills. And the larger mills, in other words, mills with more than one milling unit at 3,000 pounds an hour, those larger mills, they could contain more milling units and uh, at the opposite end, the very small mills are feasible. So there's a, a wide range of possibility there. The actual mill capacity calculated could be much greater. It could be doubled. I mean, if it was round the clock milling, it could be um, what, eights into 24, three times, could be tripled. So more like 15 million pounds coming from those mills each year. So another piece of, another number to add to the arithmetic, um, there are 58 counties in California. So that would average about, at our previous calculation, about six mills in each county. But uh, in Los Angeles area and the San Francisco Bay region, that concentration would be far greater and uh, to serve the population. And uh, in the sparsely populated counties, of course, there might be just one mill. So we've mentioned job creation already uh, higher in the list, um, but it, it's, uh, it involves modern equipment, or even if it involves old fashioned equipment with modern uh, powering, still the production of flour is a skill. And uh, each mill will need local workers and uh, it will need some skilled workers. So basically the market, as far as I can see from all of this, is wide open for small whole grain flour mill entrepreneurs. So having decided that uh, a mill is feasible and uh, sustainable, how would we make it sustainable from the very start? Especially knowing the two main problems that, that uh, are being faced right now in considering such a project. The first consideration is that the locally produced grain 
is still relatively small amount unless you're looking at the commodity farmer who's still um, in the commodity system, a commodity farmer coming out of that system and into this localized system might present a different picture. But for the moment, on the small scale, the localized scale, um, there might not be enough local grain to justify a mill and uh, the staff involved in, in running it. Um, and also, there might be an insufficient initial demand for that flour. After all, people haven't come to terms with having 100% whole grain food as their main stay. So how are we going to solve these problems? Well, if um, initially, the mill is owned by a group of wheat farmers all wanting to grow more grain, then that mill would certainly have a good source of local wheat. And if they're trying, if the goal is to keep the mill occupied and uh, really supply people with whole grain flour, it is possible to import less expensive wheat from out of state. I can tell you this story that uh, a Canadian farmer called me and said, I'd like to sell my Canadian wheat in California. Are you interested? And I said, well, um, tell me more. And he said, well, I've noticed that uh, trucks drive up to Canada full of fruits and vegetables from California and they're coming back empty to California. I could send my wheat to California in those empty trucks and uh, it's less expensive than the cost of production for a California wheat farmer and so that wheat could be imported and would supplement the supply for a local mill to make it uh, viable. Of course, the local flour would be preferred, again, because the ownership of that mill would, and the interests in that mill would be local. Now, supposing you're also considering this, this uh, very difficult one of insufficient initial demand for the flour, before ever opening that mill, it would be worth working to find bakers and consumers who really want that flour. And they're out there. There are people who, who really want this 100% whole grain flour, especially people who are diabetic and have realized that they need to be eating 100% whole grain foods. They're, they're desperate. They're mostly making their own bread at home, but uh, they would like a, an outside supply. So it is possible to work to find these people who could be a, a solid customer base for the mill. And the other side of this is that uh, baker and consumer education really need to be increased. And uh, that can be part of the effort. And also in, with these kind of um, high speed impact mills, it's possible to dry other foods, other, um, com other uh, crops such as chickpeas or other beans. They can be ground to flour and uh, there are people who really want those flowers, especially the chickpea flower, for instance, in the Indian market. So how do we have this way forward? How do we make our way forward um, into this alternative system? I think it's important to realize that, that um, people generally have not yet being presented with really good 100% whole wheat products in an amount that 
suggests that it's worth looking for them. They need to be produced so that the customers can actually experience them. And uh, I have to tell this story of Steve Jobs. The cell phone was a very nice gadget that everybody thought was the ultimate. And Steve Jobs had to actually produce the iPhone, the smartphone, before people could appreciate just how very useful it is. And so it is with these 100% whole grain products. We have to produce them in a delicious form and we have to produce enough of them and it will be like the iPhone. Once people really taste those and live with those whole grain products, there's no turning back. Another thing to realize in, in California's particular case, these heritage wheat varieties that have interesting flavor and differences to the commodity wheat that we've been used to, these wheat varieties are actually drought tolerant and we need that in California in our climate. And they can be grown here organically with the available rainfall for the most part and without huge, the expensive input. They don't yield in the way that uh, commodity wheat yields, but then the inputs are different and the effect of these large rooted varieties is to improve the soil. And they're, if they're grown organically, then the soil is regenerated and that's a plus economically for the farmer immediately. So we've shown that there's plenty of marketing space, absolutely it's wide open for anyone who wants to sell their California grown wheat as 100% whole wheat flour. And the missing link, the real missing link is the will of federal and state governments to support. We need to have subsidies so that we can provide access. We cannot wait for government action. We need to take charge. We need to build our own fully working, 100% whole grain food infrastructure right here in California. Thank you for your attention.